Let's start with um, why we think phage are important. So the number thing is the main, uh, the main key to um, getting into this. There's about 10 million viruses per mil in the oceans. That's in the surface ocean. It's about uh, 10 to 10 billion in uh, uh, gram of uh, soil. They're all over in sediments, et cetera. You yourself, most, the most common biological entity you have in you, of course, is your viruses, et cetera. So the, the numbers are the main thing. Okay. And the reason we have so many of them in all these environments is because of this thing right here, which is the um, dissolved organic matter pool. So most of the time we're interested in these things up here, the big things that we can eat and so forth. And what's going on is the photosynthesizers are pumping at least about 50% of, uh, of any of the photosynthate that they make in a particular amount of time into this dissolved organic matter pool. And that's directly feeding the heterotrophic bacteria sitting here. And the heterotrophic bacteria then are being grazed down by two groups, uh, two predator groups, the, pro, uh, the phage viruses and then the uh, protists. There's some rule out there that's uh, approximately right, which is that you'll always have 10 viral-like particles per cell in any ecosystem. And um, there's about 10 to the 31 viruses on the planet. And you can do a whole bunch of cool calculations about what that actually means. But this is why it's probably important to some place like the, um, well, it, when we start thinking about how the planet works and how energy moves through the planet. So this is a calorimetry experiment. And what we're going to do here is we're going to have um, a calorimeter where in this, uh, this side you're going to put basically food. So that's the dissolved organic matter pool. So you're going to filter out everything and just put dissolved organic matter in it. And then on this other side, you're going to put the dissolved organic matter pool plus some cells, just a small bit of a cell inoculum. And then over time, you're going to measure the temperature, the temperature change between that, and you can, of course, convert that to joules if you want. And this tells you how much work the microbes in, that in the sample cell are doing. We're going to modify this experiment. And what we're going to do is we're going to, instead of just, now we're going to have the food, OK? We're going to have that inoculum that has some of the bacteria. And then to one side, we're going to add the viral concentrate. And to the other side, we're going to take a killed viral concentrate. And then over time, we're going to follow the temperature, and we're going to follow the numbers of uh, or microbes and viruses there. And this totally, wow, I can say whatever I want. Yay. <laughs> so viruses are the most important thing ever. Nothing else matters. You guys got that? OK. Sorry, I don't know what happened. So what this could allegedly show you is that where you have the viral concentrates, um, all of the, uh, uh, the, the standing stock of bacteria have actually been knocked down about an order of magnitude. So you have 10 times as many bacteria right here than you do here. Okay. All right, so that tells you that the carrying capacity of the system is much higher than what you're actually always uh, observing. But the really important thing is here in this totally illegible slide. So this is the heat output. So remember, in the side where you have the viruses, you actually have fewer bacteria. But your heat output is actually much higher, which is telling you that the system is moving faster. So it's doing more work. You're creating more entropy if you want. Okay? So if you do this and you just calculate, you come up with numbers like this. So you could do about a half a joule um, per mil, or per 20 mils per uh, 36 hours, somewhere in there. That means that the ocean, the global ocean, over the course of a year, actually does something like 10 to the 23rd, or the phage in the ocean, do something like 10 to the 23rd, 10 to the 24th joules worth of work. Okay. which is equivalent to all of the energy that's stored in the fossil fuels on the planet. So it's a big number. Okay. So this is one of the cool things about them. The, um, I'm not going to talk much about this. Is, I just wanted to show you this. So they're major players um, in global carbon cycling. They're really abundant. I'm not going to show you anything about this, but they're actually moving DNA around in the system. But what I want to really take you into today is this other thing about increasing microbial diversity. And it comes from this idea of kill the winner. Okay. And the, this comes to my second review 
from the JGI. Okay. So the review is that um, we propose to sequence viruses, and not only are they not important, but it'll never work if we just go do random sequencing. And that um, even if we could get the sequences, they'll never, we'll never be able to interpret them. And then the best one is that, why don't we just sequence the 16S? <laughs> so many of you in this room may be able to answer that question. But in case you don't know, they don't actually have a 16S, which makes them a little different. So they don't have 16Ss. And uh, of course, it's really hard to culture them because you have to culture the host first. And they don't have any gene that they all have. They don't even all share a capsid gene, it turns out. So the, there's no really good way of going and doing the targeted sequencing. So that really leads you, the only way to do it is shotgun metagenomics. And the, our basic protocol would be um, if we're doing aquatic system, for example, we'll go and we'll just filter out the microbes. We're going to concentrate the viruses on a 100 kD filter. And then we go through all these things to purify them. So we DNA, we RNAs. And then since that gets a lot of the environmental DNA that's free is not sensitive to DNA. So we actually use cesium chloride. That works well for viruses because they, um, they're half D DNA and half protein about. So they go to a particular place in the cesium chloride gradient extract the uh, viral DNA, and then depending on what part of the decade we're talking about, we would either sequence them with Sanger stuff or we would um, uh, do uh, 454 sequencing. And we've done this all over the place. If you take most of our data and you kind of, um, and you keep asking yourself, well, every time I get a data set, how much of that matches what's in the uh, non-redundant database, you come up with this really interesting phenomena that we're not getting, we're not coming anywhere towards the plateau. So every time we look at a thing, we're still getting at least about 25% are known. Everything is unknown against the non-redundant database. And some environments, that's worse. If you go to like a stromatolite or the oxygen minimum zones in the oceans, it'll be more like 0.1% or 1% of the DNA has any recognizable se sequence. And then if you go into the human system, sometimes you'll get up to 30%. And that's usually because we have herpes viruses or something around, running around in us. Okay. We can say pretty confidently now that viriomes represent the uh, largest part of sequence space out there um, that is unexplored. It's not clear that it's the biggest part of sequence space, though. So it's unexplored, but it may not be bigger than the microbes. All right. The, since most of what we find are unknowns, so and we're not going to figure it out by doing uh, similarity searches, what we do is we use all these other mathy tools. And this is um, one of our favorites, which is a way of uh, calculating diversity based on assemblies. And we'll take a metagenome, we'll, we'll assemble it, and then what we look for are contigs. So every time you find a contig, that means that you've actually found that same individual twice in the sample, right? Or some variant thereof. And from that, you get this thing we call a contig spectra, and you can predict the number of things there. And this is what we call a metagenomic genotype or species. So that's our working definition. And this is where we come up with these ideas that viral diversity is the highest of any system. And by that, I mean it's actually several order, orders of magnitude higher than the next closest relative. So they're really diverse. Right? The way you look at this sort of plot is you just look at the pretty colors, because most of us are biologists. So this is a Monte Carlo simulation. And the red is the most likely explanation of our data. Along here, we've got the percent or the number of viral genotypes we estimate in there. And then this is the relative abundance of the most abundant one. Okay. The, what this plot is telling you is something like marine sediments will have anywhere from 10,000 to a million different viral genotypes per kilogram is the take home message. In something like a seawater, it'll be about 5,000 per 100 liters. And then in, um, in uh, human feces, it'll be somewhere, let's say, 1,000 per um, about a kilogram. Okay. So it's much less diverse associated with us, very diverse in sediments and soils. Okay. The question is, is how do you get all of this diversity? So this is one that has been one of the main driving things in my lab for a long time. And um, the, the idea here is something that's called kill the winner or a Lockevoltera sort of behavior. 
it's really fairly simple. You can imagine one prey species coming up, okay, and then its predator species coming along and killing it, okay, which allows another prey species to come in. Okay. And you do that over time, and the more events that you have like that, the more diversity you can um, create. However, this behavior actually seems to go against this idea of predictable micro microbial taxa and metabolic activity that we see in lots of environments. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So this is a study where what we've done is we've used metagenomes in a whole bunch of different environments. So we've gone and got, you know, subterranean samples and fish slime and et cetera, et cetera, um, cow rumens, et cetera. And what we're doing is we're gonna take and get the micro microbial fraction, the viral fraction, we're gonna sequence them, and then we're gonna do a, a bunch of analysis to see what's there. And you can do this in two ways. You can do functional analysis, which is using a small part of your sequence to make a, a guess at what sort of uh, proteins do they encode. Throw that into one of these massive clustering algorithms and ask the simple question, do, if I do this, do I see signatures that tell me what environment I'm looking at? And if so, how much does it tell me about the uh, environment? And it turns out to be incredibly good. So um, these are the, the dots, the colors of the dots tell you um, uh, what environment it came from. And what you can see is with either the microbiomes or the variomes, you actually can explain something at least 80% of the variance in the data just based on the functional analysis. You can also do this blind because remember that's going to only be based on like a couple percentage in the case of the variums. Um, so you can do it in another way, which is you just use a dinucleotide signature and you can ask the same question and what you'll find is the same answer. You can explain about 80% of the variance between the data just with dinucleotides. So it doesn't matter if you know what it's doing, the information's there, we just have to figure out how to get it. Okay. That really says that uh, different environments are metabolically stable. Okay. So how do we get this, all this diversity, but we get um, all of this, these changes? And we've picked a diversity gradient to do this. And the diversity gradient is this um, uh, uh, aquaculture system and a saltern system. So this is freshwater going to low salinity. So this is actually the bay in San Diego. And this low salinity pond is just a little higher than regular seawater, so say 3.6% salt. And then it goes up to here, which is about 12%, and then this is about 35 to 40% salt. Okay. And the diversity gradient for the microbes is this has um, very, the diversity is very low. It's highest in these two and lower here, right? So you get your in intermediate disturbance sort of curve going across that. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take different samples over different times and see what's happening in both the viral and the microbial communities. Now, as, you, um, as I showed you before, um, if you just look at the metabolic um, signatures here, so we're taking, we're sequencing a whole bunch of um, uh, d microbial DNA, then we're just asking what genes do they encode by blasting against the C database, and then we're just gonna assign them. We use a thing called Zype to do the statistics to see what's different. What you find is that basically there's no change in metabolic potential encoded by the, the microbes over time in these systems. So they seem to be very uh, consistent. And that's because we're controlling the environmental conditions because they're a man-made environment in this case. The other thing that you see is that actually every environment has a different signature, which goes back to that plot I showed you before. Okay. You can also look at this, the taxa. So what we've got here is we're gonna take all of the metagenomes and we're gonna blast them against complete genomes. And then we're gonna, if we get a certain uh, uh, type of hit, we're gonna say that that's the same organism or closely related to it. And then we're gonna plot the relative abundances. So going along here, you have all the time points and then these are different pond systems. Um, and then you have the microbes versus the viruses. And what I want you to do is memorize every one of those things Okay, but no. Okay, so what you're actually trying to see is that the, um, that whatever's abundant at one particular time point remains abundant through the whole system at this level of analysis. So it doesn't matter whether it's a virus or not. Okay? The things that are less abundant actually will come in and out, and these are transient or they're below our limit of detection. But they appear to be very stable over time. 
this is um, one of this is another sort of that the same sort of plot, but this is with the viriomes. And what we have is going along the bottom is the phage proteomic tree. And what that is is all of the phage uh, genomes um, in some sort of uh, phylogeny that we made up. And each one of these ends is a different genome. And then this is how much the, the bars represent the relative abundance of those genomes in the samples that we get. And what I want you to notice is that it shows you first by each environment, you get different patterns, right? So there, every environment has a different type of microbial or viral community living in it. And they're also incredibly stable. So these things almost look like chromatographs of the same sample, right? So they're not changing over time very much at this level of analysis. And you can also see how repeatable, in quote, out quote, um, metagenomics can be because these are actually done in different, by different people in different labs, to tell you the truth. So we've combined data sets and we get the same answer. All right, so everything looks to be stable at the level of, the, uh, of these um, uh, taxonomical and metabolic uh, markers. So how do we get all of that diversity in the microbial or in the viral genomes? And we go back to this same idea here. So remember, to estimate diversity, what we do is we assemble, and then we get a context vector, and then we use that to predict the number of types of things. Okay. We've modified that where what we actually do is we take a one metagenome and we assemble it against the second metagenome. So in this time, we're going to do different time points, for example. Okay. And then what we're looking for are contigs that assemble between different environments, and we can use that to ask basically this two questions. If you do the same environment against itself, for example, what you'll find is that the relative abundances, so this is a rank abundance curve, so your most abundant thing is rank one, et cetera, as you go down. So if you were to do the same environment against itself or the two environments were exactly the same, what you'd find is rank one is the same abundance at different time points, and you've got the same types of micro or viruses there. There's possible, two possibilities for changes. One is, is that you've got the same types of microbes there, but they've changed their relative ranks. So rank one is now become rank 200 or something. Okay? The other possibility is that you've just lost ones from here and you've added new viruses to the system. So we've just switched it over. If you do this on the uh, different time points from these, um, uh, these four different samples, you get something that looks like this. So again, the red is your most likely explanation. Going along the, uh, the x-axis is the percent of um, top ranks that change. So these are, remember, the most abundant things where they are relative to each other. And then this is on the uh, y-axis is the percent of different types of viruses that have changed as guesstimated by our algorithm. So, Time one versus time two in this upper panel here shows that basically 100% of the viruses that were there um, are still there, and there's been a slight reordering of the ranks okay, at this level of the, the population really at this point. Okay. However, if you start looking at time one versus time three, what you see is that actually we've totally changed over the types of viruses that are there. In fact, it's changed so much we don't even see the signal. Okay. And then in this case, we've actually done the same thing. So we've seen all, uh, in these two cases, we've totally changed what's there. In the other case, we've actually only changed the relative ranks of each other. So this is telling you, even though they look taxonomically and metabolically the same, they're actual, the, t the exact types of organisms at the population level have actually changed dramatically in that system. Okay. Here's another example of this. So this is just a, um, this is to give you a feel of how fast it can happen. So this is a medium salinity pond, same idea. This is the percent of uh, genotypes that are uh, shared, or the, and then this is a percent permuted, or that, that's the relative changes in ranks going along this. So you can see from November 10th versus November 11th, what's happened is there's already a change in the percent that are shared. So they're already starting to change. And then, of course, over time, it changes. And we can often see where it looks like it cycles back. So you've gone through all these different types of populations, but then you get back to the ones that you were at before. 
Does that make sense? So everything is at one level, like the higher order levels, they're all there all the time. But actually at the population level of the individuals, they are changing really rapidly, even at the order of about a half a generation. Okay. All right, so how do we put this together? So we know that when we go into a particular environment that we expect different things. So we've seen that. I showed you that in the salt terms. We see it in metagenomes all over the world. We also know that just intuitively. If you go to the middle of the ocean, you're going to find Prochlorococcus and SAR11, right? So we know that that's basically how it is. Uh, Jed Furman has shown that there's cyclical behavior in this too um, uh, off uh, LA. Okay. Now, the, the problem that we run into is we expect the dominant microbes to be wiped out, which is that kill the behavior, kill the winner behavior. So how we are dealing with this is we're saying that we actually have all these different populations of the same types of viruses rapidly changing along in this time frame. So the black species is the same, but all the strains are changing underneath. So it looks like they're relatively the same, but they've actually changed individuals over time. Okay? And this really matches an evolutionary paradigm called the Red Queen, which is that idea of predator preys running from each other to stay in the same place. Right? So they're just running along, and they have to change so that they don't die. Okay? And then you have to change so that you can eat them. All right. And this has a good prediction that we should be able to uh, see this at the genome level. And this is um, actually from H Phil Hugenholtz's group. One way of looking at this is you should be able to go into the genomes and actually see uh, changes within a genome that tell you that the, uh, the microbes are being attacked by the viruses and that's what they're changing to do that. And this is, um, uh, this is from a sludge pond. Basically, for some reason, Phil likes these things, so they're gross, but, or this is a reactor, right? Yeah. And what, what's going on here is that they've got microbial metagenomes, and they're going to ask the ones on Australia versus the U.S., are they the same? And if you just do a gene tree, um, what happens is that they look very scrambled. You couldn't really differentiate where one metagenome had come from in the world just by looking at it that way. And they, they share a lot of... Uh, identity at the genome level. However, the thing that, um, this was mostly Victor's work, um, what, he f what Victor found was that if he looked at phage attachment sites within the genome, that they're changing their EPS, so that's their outside thing. And that's one of the classical things that, that microbes change to avoid being attacked by a virus, so that's a primary defense. They also downregulate different uh, uh, outer membrane proteins and so forth. And you can see evidence of that in others. And then there's secondary defenses, which is once the phages are, once a virus or phage is injected its DNA, then you have other things that block it. And in the uh, microbial world, um, one of these things that's um, become more clear over the years has been these CRISPR elements, which are basically antisense things that will stop um, the, the viruses during the infection cycle. Of course, more classical are restriction enzymes and that nature. So things like that, once the DNA gets in, they actually have different restriction enzymes that wipes out the virus, or they use these CRISPR elements. And Jill Banfield and, and Mark Young have also found a whole bunch of examples of this in different systems. So what these things say is the main changes in the microbial metagenomes are actually the antiviral things. Okay. The other thing is, of course, if you do a whole survey of microbes out there, what you're going to find out if you just do these scatter plots, um, if you take a, a, a genome that you know and then you scatter metagenomics, the other main difference you're going to find are the prophage, right? So it's the prophage are moving between the systems. So. So these are their main uh, pressure that they're under. Okay? We should be able to see that in the viruses themselves. And um, the way we looked at this is we took a, a, a marine phage called Rosio uh, phage SIO1. And we've got different isolates of it that sc scan about a decade and from different places in uh, Southern California. And we went and we resequenced five of them. And I want you to just notice this one right here. This one, um, this is the host range of it. So we isolated on this, this host. And then we would check it against other hosts. And this one actually had an expanded host range. So it was the only one that could actually attack a different one. Okay. We resequenced it. And when we did, the main difference between them was actually the tail fiber. 
right? So that's what the phage uses to find its host out in the environment. So the, this is that, um, this part of the um, uh, genome right there. So you see most of the changes in the tail fiber, okay? Everything else is pretty much identical. There are some changes to some of the open reading frames. There's no rearrangements. Um, and if you look at DSDN, it's always, there's always purifying selection as far as we can tell, except for the tail fiber. Okay. And the, um, the one that had the expanded host range has actually lost its tail fiber. So it's gone to another way of getting, finding its host out there. Okay. Again, that supports the Red Queen hypothesis. All right, so that seems perfect, right? We've got it figured out. We know how this is working. The phages are coming in, they're killing things, and then you get new microbial strains. And of course, um, then some reviewer points out that we could be totally wrong. And the idea is follow the winner, which is something that is basically a bottom-up sort of thing, which is the idea that as what we're actually looking at is that there's subtle, subtle changes in the foods that are available, that leads to a different strain, and then, then you're seeing the viruses there, right? So we don't have any data to answer that, so we do what most people do when we have no data. We do a simulation. So if you do the simulation, it turns out that it actually works perfectly because we made the rules. So, um, <laughs> and what I'd like to point out here is that it matches our data perfectly, but we have really no data. We're setting up a thing to do here. The, the main thing for here is that if you uh, build a system where you have many substrates and then you randomly change them, what, if you don't have phage predation, um, what you see is that you get a real lowing of diversity. So it's all driven by the food that's available. Um, so one thing goes up and then uh, it becomes abundant and then goes back down and another thing comes up. But if you add the phage, it actually evens out and you get a much higher diversity. And um, that's what we're pursuing right at the moment. With that, I'd like to thank all the people that did it. The math group, of course, uh, Rob Edwards, who does most of our bioinformatics, as well as my lab, who does a ton of stuff, and then the people that paid for it. And with that, I'll quit and take questions. Repeat after me first, sludge is beautiful. It's <laughs> gross. No. Um, questions? Study coral <laughs> reefs. Come on. <laughs> no questions. Just a technical question. Yeah. What, would you explain a bit on what you meant by dinucleotides itself explaining the variants? Right. So the so you can just ask a sequence um, the relative frequencies of dinucleotides in them. So do, you know an A next to a G or something of that nature, and just normalize uh, for the the skews that you would get anyhow. And if you do that, what well, we we find we, this is uh, what's Carlin's approach to the uh, looking at dinucleotides. If you do that and then you just ask if I'm going to, let's do, initially we would do a PCA for example and we would just cluster and we would say do the different environments pop out. How much do, can we explain per component on the PCA? We usually use a CDA after we figured that out and then you do it that direction. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> It's just math stuff. It doesn't matter that much. It's lies anyhow. Statistics. Oh, I did, yeah. Yes. So my question is, it, it hasn't escaped your attention probably that none of the cyanobacteria in the oceans have the CRISPRs. Do you have any conjectures yeah. about why that might be? Uh, is, Jill isn't here, so I can say I don't think CRISPRs are very important in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> but don't tell her that. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah, there's no, there's, it, they're using other systems, right? There's a always, there's a lot of, remember, it, it really does happen, you know, can you get in? There's your primary ones. Your secondary ones, there's a ton of them, right? You, it's just they, they don't happen to use CRISPRs um, in that system. And then when you get back out, right, there's all these other ways of keeping them from being able to blow up the host. So it just is that we don't know what it is in the ocean right at this moment. But yeah. do you think lysogeny could be a big part of this whole story? No, lysogeny is not as important, at least in the ocean. Um, lysogeny is important in like the human gut, for example. Um, most production in the ocean where we've directly measured it is lytic. That's mostly Jed Furman's group. 
group. It doesn't mean there's actually, uh, in the open ocean, there's all this genomic evidence that lysogeny is extremely important. In fact, the guy sitting behind you would tell you more about that than me. <laughs> hey, Forrest, great talk. Um, your rosea phages that were isolated over 10 years um, are 20% less divergent than cyanophages we isolate from the same water sample. Do you have any speculation on what you think is going on? Well, remember, we actually looked for things that were extremely closely related. So probably what it is is that in your case, you actually have all that diversity within that same sample, and that's why you're seeing it. We're actually forcing, you know, we only wanted roseophage, you know, SIL1 effectively. So we screened very strongly for it. So Forrest, of the very small number of genes from the marine phage compartment that you can recognize and type, do any activities, anything at all stand out for, uh, Probably, functionally? Yeah, I mean, the, the most fun story, I mean, there's a couple really fun stories. Again, Matt Sullivan has been following this up more than anybody else, but the phosphate recycling, I think, is really an interesting story there. And then the, uh, the photosynthesis genes uh, being carried by the phage are really exciting. So there's um, both photosystem one and photosystem two. And it's in the photosystem one case, it's not even clear that they're actually using it to do regular photosynthesis. So they may be doing something else. So there's some very interesting genes that have popped out. Um, those would be the main ones. 